Welcome to another episode of the Magnus and Marcus podcast. I'm Steve Magnus, the head cross-country coach at the University of Houston, author of The Science of Running. I'm joined, as always, by John Marcus, the head coach of High Performance West. John, good to be chatting again. Oh, I'm back and I'm hungry to give the people what they want. (laughs) Good, good, good. Man, I love the love the energy you bring. I'm in the uh, beginning of cross-country season, um, not downside, but that point where you get excited and then you hit that lull because you're like in the grind like you are training-wise. So, um, this That's is, when you got to wake up and you got to stay hungry. You I just got to go. You got to go eat, eat, eat. Cafeteria is open. You're eating. So get after it. And hopefully, we can give some nourishment the people coming back to us for a little bit something else so uh, that that's a great point that ties into the topic of today because i think being hungry plays a big role in it and what we're going to talk about is mindsets during racing right so with cross country getting started we were talking offline a little bit on how kids transition from high school to college And a lot of times you see this gung-ho high school kid who killed it maybe in the small school divisions and always placed or always medaled or always had a shot at the win. So they were always competing. But then they come into college and in their first cross-country race with 150 other guys and the race goes out and, you know, 440 or something like that. And they are way out the back. And they're coming through in 90th place in five minutes. And you can tell that it's just not what they're expecting. And they almost shut it down. Right? And their mindset, you just see it. You just see this like, oh, I'm kind of going to give up because I'm not up near the front. Um, something you've experienced, John? You know, first and foremost, I I want to I want to call out the high school coaches who are to blame for that (laughs) seriously like i i keep talking to people all the time and it's been like the last month like people think coaching is workout facilitation creating a cell sheet of progressions of rep sets durations of exercises and prescriptions of mileage and volume and intensity and you know what it is but it's only the tip of the iceberg and that's the hard part. We spend all this time on the, the, the smallest 5% that we are not sure of, and we forget the other 95% that matters most. And that's real coaching is exactly that. It's knowing people, getting inside their heads, and teaching them the goal of the activity, the goal of anything in life is to be the best you you can be on the day. And, I mean, people struggle with it because we get addicted to this superficial, narcissistic, you know, view of ourselves that is even further now more propagated by all the social media content out there, you know, and it's not to say it wasn't around before, it's just been enhanced. And the reality is if you can't like tweet the swagger about it, if you can't show off like, oh man, I crushed this race, but no one was there who was competitive, you know, it's this idea that in the sports marketing world now they're like, oh, just tweet a picture of you winning a race because most people don't understand the difference between, you know, a woman winning a race in 19 flat for 5K versus 15 flat. And it's like, that's a problem. People need to understand that. And coaches need to infuse athletes with that belief in what, how we really get better. It's failure after failure after failure after failure, reps after reps after reps after reps. And then you get to this level of mastery versus, hey, just get the easy win and call it good. So, uh, so I've got a good story for you there. All right, so our last, our cross country meet last Friday, our first real opener of the season, right? Um, we have one of our fifth year seniors who only has indoor and outdoor eligibility left, doesn't have any cross country. He shows up to the, uh, to the meet, which is across town, to watch his teammates, right? To support and all that stuff. And he gets there and he's like, oh, I'll probably warm up with the guys. So he gets there right before the start of what they termed the college Yahoo race, okay, (laughs) which was a one mile race, okay, for like just the, you know, just random college kids to do. 
And, uh, you know, it probably had 30, 40 people in it. So a decent turnout. And it's literally five minutes before the race, that race, that this guy shows up. And the others are 45 minutes later. And uh, and a, a bunch of our guys kind of start giving Zach a hard time. They're like, oh, man, you're not racing. You should just jump in this. And at first, it's like, for the first 30 seconds, it's like, oh, they're just joking. And then some of our upperclassmen are like, Zach, you're running this race. Like, take take your take your long shorts off put on uh put on your running shoes go over there and run it and he's like i don't have a bib and they hand him <laughs> they hand him one of our bibs of someone not running he's like now you do you're all set <laughs> so he jogs over they start the race right he wins the college yahoo race in <laughs> mile race in five minutes out kicking some guy who looked horrible but was really trying um I take a picture of it, post it on Twitter, just because the guys are just, you know, laughing and having a good time. And I'm like, Zach Stewart won his first college race ever. And, you know, the, the tweet gets like 35 likes and several retweets and stuff because, you know, people just think, oh, like, look, look, this dude won. You know, this guy won. That's great. You know, it, he won, you know, 45 seconds slower than his mile PR. But, you know, the point was that that's kind of what society goes towards. It's like, oh, it doesn't really matter what the effort or the level of mastery was or what have you. It's all what does the outcome appear to look like, right? It's like, what does this, uh, does this appear to be a success? And it's like, oh, he won. That's a success. Where, they, where if I tweeted the same thing when the kid PR'd in the mile and was, you know, ninth in the race it wouldn't as appear, appear as successful and i think that appearance and that infatuation with that appearance of success is something that is getting ingrained further and further into our psyches of young adults now um before i turn things back over to you for opinion i like to connect ideas and if you look at i've been recently doing a lot of work or a lot of research into um, addiction. And the reason is because addiction is very tied to drive, desire, motivation. And if you look at addiction, it's the same things that fuel that motivation drive to be um, almost obsessively good are the same things that fuel addiction. And in, in looking at how to overcome addiction or how to deal with it, most of the research shows that it's the story in your head that needs to change, right? In or, but you, the story in your head needs to change before you can attempt recovery. And I think that we undervalue the story in our head when we are racing. And if the story in your head is, I need to have success defined by this culture of what is success, success is winning or placing or finishing high, or having the good Instagram photo, then you're going to have that story in your head and you're going to be defined in that view only, which won't in turn actually lead to success. Agreed. I mean, it's narrative, right? The narrative we tell ourselves is the most empowering tool we have. You know, creatures, human beings are now storytelling creatures, right? We evolved from a homo sapien to like a storytelling sapien creature. And that's, everyone's so harped on that. <clears throat> and the longer and longer I, I coach, it's, I realize you have to redefine the win. What is the win, right? Early on, the win is superficially, the win is complete the prescription of workouts or paces in this workout and you done did good. Or the win is PR or the win is you know, go for the overall victory. And then when that doesn't happen or when that's not going to plan or schedule and something is some adversity, some difficulty, some failure pops up, what do you do? Do you can how quickly is your rebound? Can you rebound in the moment, in the instant, after a day, after three days, a week, a month, a year? I mean that that is the thing, resiliency and robustness that kind of goes back to the anti fragile themes that we know and love and and here it's redefining the win. What is the win? The win is testing yourself. 
That is it. That is what I, I have just recently come to this in my own coaching practice. That's all I'm asking my athletes to do now. Today, go out and test yourself. Because studies have proven, again, when we are getting ready for an exam, the best way to prepare for the exam is to take practice tests. Not study and just practice the material and just in our heads and study and read and write, but it's actually to quiz ourselves without any lifelines on how well we know the material. And that's really what workouts should be. And that's really what races should be. They should be tests, test efforts. All right, guys, we're going to test ourselves today. Here is the prescription. You know, here's what we're going to try to do. But I want, you know, and the thing is you want to always qualify what you're doing with a correlation to percent perceived effort. And I, I found that from a mentor long ago, and he, he ran entire workouts off that. And I decided to, well, I want to give people structure and direction. So if we're going to do like, say, 20 times a quarter for, you know, some freshman guys, we're going to do them at like 75, you know, seconds and a 100 meter jog or 200 meter jog, whatever. You want to say, okay, guys, we're going to do 75, five minute pace. This should start off as a, you know, 75 or 80 percent effort. But by the last four or five, you should be at 90, 95 percent effort. Because it's getting more difficult to maintain this pace, maintain this rhythm. The the pace is not changing, but the effort is going up exponentially. And I think when you frame a workout or you frame a race, like, look, all I care about is you test yourself. You know, with athletes, I've started to dissect races not into distances and paces, saying, okay, hey, for this, you know, distance or for this mile, run this pace and try to run this pace. And da, 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 da. It's like I've, I've broken it into time. If it's going to take you about 16 minutes to run a 5K, first five minutes is going to, we're going to execute, try to execute this. Next seven to eight minutes, you're going to try to execute this. You know, and then the final duration, you're going to execute that. And it, all of a sudden, it lifts this pressure, it lifts this veil, it lifts this, you know, um, kind of more superficial result-driven attitude out the window. So if you get done with the race and you're like, man, that was everything I had, coach, and I got fifth, and you can say, damn, good job. But if it was, well, you got fifth, how was it? Oh, I kind of got scared and I just kind of jogged it in. I just, I, I, I wasn't getting first. And I was like, so what? And it's like, no, 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 time out. You need to put someone in time out as a coach and you need to talk to them. And you need to jump on them because most people aren't jumping on a kid or an athlete when they just pack it in. To me, that's the most scariest thing, you know, an athlete can encounter in sport is a coach who, doesn't give a shit who's not going to say look i need you to give your best effort today because that's really what we're doing with workouts and racing is we're just teaching that skill because 99.9999 percent of the athletes we all work with at every level are not going to be you know the the one athlete that redefines a generation the world champion olympic champion national champion state champion whatever conference champion they, they aren't going to be that but what they are going to be is very important people 20, 30 years down the road who are decision makers in policy and administration, you know, mothers and fathers, you know, people who are designed to keep us safe or, you know, keep things healthy or not, you know, or, or fix the direction of the planet. You know, it's like, it's critical. And I think we kind of forget that in the statistic rankings driven world where it's like, how many all Americans you coach or how many state champions or oh, how many conference titles. And it's like, What's your ranking this week, you know, on this social media outlet or this arbitrary poll that means nothing? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> whoa, take a step back and just remember that you have, as a coach, you have autonomy and you have ownership over the culture of your team or the culture of the athletes you work with and the environment to define what is a win. And if you are, you know, lack the depth to define a win as more than just the W, more than just winning the actual contest, then you need some help. And where do you get that help? Well, you get it from colleagues. You get it from mentors. You get it from peers. Like, you know, coaches, I, we, you know, some guys just thank Steve and I on uh, Twitter today. You know, we get those every once in a while. And um, I'm, I'm not good with names, so apologies to the, the mm -hmm. gentleman that I'm calling some guy. Um, <laughs> but it was like, I was like, yeah, coaches need to coach coaches. We need to coach each other up because if we don't, like I was, you know, Steve and I were talking just before this podcast, we were talking about personal growth, trying to coach each other up, like where you're at, where you're doing, okay, some strategies, like 
we all need that. And it's like, you need to seek out people that are going to be there for you. Shit, even if it's me or Steve, email us, direct message us. We will coach you. I will coach you up because what you guys are doing, whether you're elementary, middle school, high school, college, post collegiate coach, it's important, man. It's super important. I think we can't just have this superficial, um, you know, perception about what we're doing that if you didn't win the race or you didn't coach the champion, you suck because you don't. Man, preach, brother. Uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. No, it's great because I, I think that's one of the, the things that mi- that is missed is, y- yes, in this section of life that we call running, you know, making the decision to bag it in and, um, you know, almost essentially give up if you're not in the top three or top five or if it's going well. Like that might seem horrible in our sense of running right but what people forget is that those same that same process of decision making that you're ingraining under stress um when you're racing is the same default decision making scheme that you're going to default to 10 years down the line 20 years down the line when you're making that stressful business decision or that stressful life decision it's you react to stress the same way and your body's going to default back. Your brain's going to default back to what it knows. And if what it knows is to say, Hey, things aren't going well, I'm going to quit. Then it doesn't matter if that's a race. It doesn't matter if that's a business. It doesn't matter if that's teaching. Like when things get hard, you're going to default back to that. And as coaches, it's our job to teach athletes how not to do that that actually in a nutshell that's what i think mental toughness is mental toughness is making the right decision under stress that you want to okay it's it's not all this like military like go until you puke it's not the you know the football you know throw some f-bombs at you so that you appear like you're getting tough and rolling around in the mud, punching things, whatever it is they do over in that sport. Um, that, that's not what it is. Like mental toughness is a very calm thing. Mental toughness is when you're getting in a race and you're hurting and you're really bad and your brain is, your mind is screaming stop and you can just step back and say, all right, yeah, this, this kind of sucks. Like I get it. I'm hurting a lot, but this means a lot to me. So I'm going to say hi to these thoughts, acknowledge them, but then kind of let them go on and make the decision that I know I need to have to make. And that's the same mental toughness that you would have if you were, you know, a Navy SEAL and getting shot at. It's calm under pressure, making the right decisions. And I think that's something that as coaches that we really need to empower. And that starts with mindset racing. It starts with saying, defining a win, as you said, and defining what a success is and defining, defining what it means to be tough and what it means to be persistent and what it means to be resilient. And it's not this thing of, oh, you ran the, you were in the top three. So you are these things, check, check, check. It's no, did you execute these things the best you can? Even if you were a hundredth, if you were a hundredth place and you did the best that you could, then that's being tough. That's having the right mindset. But in a lot of settings as coaches, we would scald that that person who got a hundredth as being a failure and not doing better when that was everything they have. And I think as coaches, it's it's easy to fall into that trap of rewarding people for performance based on the easily measurable attributes of of place. But when I look at athletes and when I give my post-race kind of breakdown as a group and 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 individuals i tend to rely on things i see with my eye when racing it's when it was really hurting when that when that gap formed when i yelled and screamed at you that you were our fifth fifth man or fifth woman and that we were going to rely on you did you did you respond did you make the decisions as best you could in that moment and that's kind of what I tend to judge by, not the not the end result or places and stuff like that. As a coach, you have to take the higher road. 
like there might be all this pressure on you from your AD, from your athletic department, from your assistant coach, your head coach, you know, to perform these results, like put up or shut up, put up or shut up or, you know, get out type situation. And though those, those exist, unfortunately, but you have to take the higher road. You have to break down what it is you're really aiming to do and what it is you really want these young men and women or grown men and women who you're working with to digest that's going to be sustainable over the long term. You know, and I think the, once you get to a point of maturity in your coaching, when you'll coach anybody and everybody and you know why you're coaching and it goes beyond the accolades or accoutrements that come with success, then you've really started to master your craft. Like, you know, I always tell, you know, athletes, it's not about the shoes, it's about what you do in it. A good team culture and a good team environment is not having everyone dress identically in the same kit at practice, in the same things come race day, you know, and making sure everyone's uniform or everyone has a duffel bag of workout gear. People were running very, very fast in T-shirts in the 1970s and 80s. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like They were running very, very fast with about with on Chuck Taylor Converse's, with shoes that didn't have any technology in them. You know, a lot of people are doing that. And that's the thing. It's like we have to be the gatekeepers and the caretakers of that culture because that's what being a distance runner and a runner and an athlete really is. And unfortunately, we have this new paradigm where, you know, being an athlete is like, man, you get all these technological enhances, these amazing facilities, these accoutrements of, oh, training table or gear or all-star meets or all-star this and, oh, my God, this preferential treatment, you know, when really it was born out of we aren't, we aren't asking for much. We just want to work our butts off and see what we're made of. Like, I don't, I don't care if I have to lift, you know, hay bales. I'm going to get after it. Like, think Rocky Four, you know, training in the woods versus the, you know, whole Eastern Bloc Russian sports sciences you know, cheating, training, technology things. And it's like Rocky found what he was made of in the woods, running up mountains in the snow and, you know, lifting up wheelbarrows and stuff with rocks. It's the same movement patterns as if you were in the gym, you know, doing squats, doing push-ups, pull-ups, whatever, right? So you got to come back to that. I mean, everywhere I've been as a coach, I've had to build a culture out of nothing start a group out of nothing, you know, re jumpstart a really lagging, um, you, you know, uh, team. I mean, it's every, every spot it's been un underdeveloped, neglected areas. And we did it every single time because we all believed in each other and the athletes believed in the teammates and they believed in the, you know, environment I was trying to create more about the day to day versus, Oh man, look, look at all the stuff we have. And I think, you know, we got to, as coaches, you have to really regrain and reinforce that because the fast fashion or the fast fashion industry is now making its way to the athletic industry. And it's all about getting all this stuff very quickly. I'm not bashing the industry by any means, but you have to temper that. Like if you have it and you have all those luxuries of those things, like man, be know how blessed you are and be thankful for it and really appreciate it and make the most of it. And if you don't, don't see it as a barrier. It's not. I mean, um, I, Steve and I were just talking beforehand and, you know, uh, a, a buddy of ours or a call or I guess a peer, you know, tweeted something on Twitter that just, it was like, yes, it hit home the point. Like David Joyce, who's, um, you know, written some high performance manuals on, um, you know, in strength and conditioning, training and all this good stuff. You know, he, he threw out a tweet and I was like, man, that was on the money 100%. And it's like high performance doesn't always have to take huge resources, but it does have to take resourcefulness, continual improvement, and attention to detail. And that's really what it is. We think, you know, we need to have all the elements in place that can attribute and can lead us to success before we can have success. And I'm like, no, it is the other way around. <laughs> Uh, you got to invest in you. You got to, you got to pay your own tuition, man. I remember talking when I was a college coach recruits, it was like, Oh, well, I'm going to come there. If I get a full ride, I go, no, you don't get it. Your tuition is an investment in you and your future. And you being on this team is an investment in who you're going to become. And if you're not willing to invest in you, nobody's going to invest in you. And 
you know, it's just like you see it, the more you're attuned to it, the more you see it. I was talking to a, a PE teacher who shares a, a, one of the high school or from the high school of the track. You know, my uh, my high performance group, you know, has athletes work out on occasion. He, he was old track decathlete. So he's always like, oh, we'll get out of lane one. And we've had a great rapport for a long time. And it's the beginning of the year for school in Oregon here. And they're having kids do mile tests. And he was, you know, most high school kids are really apathetic about it. And here's this kid who's freshman and, you know, he had the fastest time and he gets across the line. And he's like, teach, what what I get? And he's like, 513 for the mile. It's like, oh, I want to break five. And I was like, and told the teacher, I said, man, you can work with that. <laughs> you can work with that. And that's ideally what we want to do is that is our job as coaches is to inspire and continually motivate every athlete number one to number 101 uh in one of my favorite stories of collegiate coaching was we went to Peyton jordan with like three athletes you know that i was coaching at the time you know two or two women and then a post collegiate and they all ran the 5k and they all stunk it up at Peyton jordan like dropped out just ran like slow and i was like oh my god i'm the worst coach in the world like oh Every single one, I go, I got to rethink what I'm doing here. <laughs> and, you know, there was another meet in Oregon and this, you know, kind of walk-on gal was a former basketball player who, you know, kind of one foot in, one foot out, always with running and training and did it because, you know, it's the camaraderie and, you know, she wasn't really getting much scholarship dollars, but she's there because she just like liked working out and running hard. And this is division one level and she runs, you know, a phenomenal 10K for her, like 38 minutes and 40 seconds. I've never been so pumped for a 38 minute, 40 second mm -hmm. 10K in my life because it qualified at a conference. It was a huge PR and I, I wasn't even there to witness it. And I was like so pissed off. It's like I opted to go to Peyton Jordan to try to see these athletes run like in the 16s and 15s and they all bombed. And then I wasn't there to go see this young lady have probably the race of her life. And I was like, dang it and I, I felt like i wasn't mad at the athletes who didn't you know uh, perform to the desired level of expectation or standard that we had going to Peyton jordan but i was like i can't believe i missed that moment oh that's what we've been working for for three years and i remind you know coaches it's like the you know chinese bamboo tree you know it has this nut this you know see this it's like a nutty it's a huge it's but, you know, what happens is you have to cultivate it for five years. Five years, you have to put it in the ground. You know, it has to be in the ground. You have to water it and make sure it has, um, you know, good uh, attention and care and sunlight and fertilizer. And you can't go wrong. For five years, you have to be on top of it. If you, you know, skip or you miss out or you're kind of infrequent, it's just going to, like, you know, get crack and die and it won't grow. But after five years, the tree will sprout up. 90 to 100 feet in six weeks so it's five years with no signs of growth none zero like you're like is this thing even working and then all of a sudden boom sprouts up and like that is what we're doing with coaching um you know what start, started this was an athlete that i'm working with a high level athlete she had a, a, a former coach and she just learned bad habits not because the, the guy's a bad coach but it's like the bad habit was if you do this workout, that means you're in this shape. It's direct correlation. You did this. You're ready to go in four days to go run this. And I was like, there's no way. There's no way. You can't. It's not. What, what you're ready to do is a culmination of what you've been doing for years and years and years, reps and reps and reps, failures and miles and miles and workouts and workouts. And when you finally put the pieces together mentally, emotionally, physically, then you can go do it. But just because you did this like Bravo workout, does not mean all of a sudden you show up like a rock star and everyone's like, oh, you did this workout last week or two, or on or workout Wednesday on Flow Trek? Okay, hey, we'll just let you go to the front. You win. You, you, you're good. It's like, no, 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 no. It's not the case. And how many times have we had the, those amazing sessions where an athlete had this incredible session or string of sessions in practice and then race day is just like completely flat? You know, and that's, again, we got to get back to – having a higher standard and understanding really, really what we're trying to do here with coaching beyond just getting people prepared physically to, you know, try to be competitive with their immediate competition that they're facing the coming weekend. Man, that was, that was good. <laughs> uh -huh.
I'm feeling it. I'm not, I told I, you I'm hungry. I know you're you're on. This is what happens when we take a little bit of a break here. Sorry, this is like a. a no, brief... This is what happens when you don't coach Division One cross country. Oh man! I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Man, so, you're, you're gonna get me. Coaches, I love you guys. You're, you're... I'll probably be back coaching, so I'm gonna eat my words here in several I, years. I know <laughs> you're gonna get lit up on this, but I think you know. I think that's a. I just think it's a good point. You know, I think a lot of times we just lose, especially when you're in the college or even the high school system. What happens is you go on almost autopilot mode around everything that doesn't revolve around the most important things, which most of the time we deem as the actual training, right? So what I see in high school and college coaches a lot is the training aspects get emphasized is there's so much put into uh, th uh, so much thought process being put into the periodization, when to do this workout, when to do the next, um, how much rest, how many reps, what speeds, all that, you know, mumbo jumbo that we all love. And you mean the science of running? Yeah. Uh, that, that thing, <laughs> that thing I wrote a book on, um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I'm just on, man. I'm just giving you're, you're, just, man, you're, just, you're just gonna light into me all, all time. That's great. Um, yes, that thing I wrote like 300 pages on. We spend a lot of time on that, and obviously I do too. But I think what happens is, is as we've talked about here, is the blinders get put on, and that becomes the point of emphasis because that is the thing that we believe controls our destiny towards this find success which would be the placings that we get at a race and you know i i think it's our jobs as coaches to not only take our athletes out of that mindset and to redefine what success is and what we've all talked about but i also think it's the job of ourselves and our coaching colleagues and our mentors to take uh, ourselves out of that mindset because it's super easy to get trapped in it. I get trapped in it all the time, right? And mm -hmm. then I have to get like this dose of reality to get me out, out of that and be like, oh yeah, what matters? And um, I think it was, I, I read too many things so I confuse what came from where, but I think it was the philosopher Alan de Botton who talked about periodically, he reminds himself, how small he is in the world, right? So he goes out, he goes out and glares at the stars, or like has some posters in his uh, or some pictures in his office that depict the vastness of the universe to remind himself of, oh yeah, like I need to remain and to keep perspective. And I think that's utterly brilliant because I think what happens when we get stuck on this cycle of valuing things that we can easily measure like wins, losses, places, times, and stuff like that, is it's this matter of losing perspective and, realize, and thinking that, all right, we really, really, really matter. And these things really, really, really matter. When if we took the time, step back, we'd actually get a fuller view of, what matters in the grand scheme of things and what doesn't. And I think that lesson is incredibly valuable. And if you can find yourself ways to remind yourself and your athletes of it, I think you'll be uh, better off as a coach and hopefully as a person too. It's a question of what it, how do you define your personal, professional, and also environmental distinguishing excellence? You know, everyone has their things they're working on things are not that good at things they feel like they're really strong at strengths and weaknesses you know faults and, and admirable attributes and i always come back to that like you know i'm as a coach a little bit more scatterbrained a little bit less like okay here's your whole you know mesocycle mesocycle microcycles of training here's what we're going to do here's the structure and it's more like how are you doing that is the number one question I always ask people. How are you doing? How are you feeling? How's your energy level? Are you feeling fresh? Are you feeling energetic? Scale of zero to five, zero to 10, whatever. You know, I'm just trying to get at like, I care. I'm interested and I care. How are you? Like, 
what is causing you any distress today? Do you have anything that's emotionally unsettling right now? Are you sick? Are you not? Like those are the little things that then influence everything else instead of just being like, hey, here's the plan. Just execute the plan. And then it's like, well, it's good. We, we crave structure. We, qu- we crave that. But how many plans have been crafted with the best intentions and yet they did not achieve the desired result? And that's the hard part is progress is slow. And I remind all the athletes I work with, progress is slow. Like, you know, High Performance West is in year two, and I'm starting to coach now a lot of these athletes for the second year. I'm like, now we really start to get going here. Now we really, okay, people are stronger, they're bolder, they're wiser. You know, we now they've been through it for a year. They've seen a little bit of the ups and downs. We've They've been lifting regularly. They, they kind of know the ebb and flow. Like, now we can really get to work because – I was telling a, an, an athlete, a former college athlete of mine who, whose coach is, you know, for personal reasons, having to relocate, you know, now because she relocated a couple of years ago and we still check in. And I was like, oh, man, that sucks. You've been coached by this person who's a good coach for one year and now they're relocating. It's like, oh, that's just when it starts, you guys start to understand each other, <laughs> you know, and that's, that's the truth. It's like, what is your distinguishing excellence? And too many people are saying, it's stuff. Look at all this stuff or facilities or amenities we have. And it's like, that is a fool's errand right there. Because if you can say your distinguishing excellence is people, that I care and I, I'm interested, and I'm going to take the time to figure out and be there for you. And when you need me the most is when you have the biggest failure, that I'm going to be right there to coach you up and bring you in and be like, hey, kid, what's up? After you've done your pouting, some people it's 20 minutes, some people it's four days. I mean, everyone's different, but it's like that is our job is to be there at that moment. Not like, hey, it's this person won. They set a big PR. This is awesome. They progressed. This is great. Like, of course, we want to share in the celebration. Like, yes, like that is that is amazing. But, you know, the thing is, is you have to believe as a coach and get the athlete to believe in them even more than you, your personal belief is for that athlete. And a lot of times we believe more in the athlete than the athlete believes in themselves. But that's real coaching is to just be able to say, hey, you're on your own and you're in the moment and you're cool, calm, and collected and you make a very rational, very strategic system. And like instead of being in a race and being like, oh, man, it's hurting and it sucks. Like, oh, now we go. Yes, it's now this, now we're in this race time now. Oh, this is familiar. I smell blood. They're hurting. I'm hurting. We're all hurting. Let's roll. You know, and that was what captured people's hearts and minds about the mega stars and distance running, like the prefontaines of the world. Like he was human. You would see him getting beat and pummeled, but he'd find something despite dehabilitating sciatica, you know, despite, you know, all these things. It's like he would still find a way to get around that and perform because he really cared. And it was it wasn't necessarily just about like the you know the legends. I wasn't even alive when the guy was running, you know. But the legends are you know they still hold fast, fifty, sixty years later. And, and that's that's the stuff that we're trying to create is that distinguishing excellence. And if you can walk into as a coach, a cross country race, or you can walk in and the other kids on the team like, oh, there's that team. They're tough. There's always tough. Oh man, you've done a great job. But if you walk in and it's like, they're like, oh, they're good, but they're only good when it's easy. And, you know, as long as we're a little bit tougher than them or we, we strive to be tougher, like we'll, we'll be able to go toe to toe with them. And I think that's the thing you, we as distance runners, that's our heritage is we are the toughest SOBs out there, man, on the track, you know, on the cross country course. Like that's what, that's really what the test is. It's a test of personal toughness. And, you know, no tweet, no Instagram post, no color coordinated pack from any, you know, athletic distributing brand or fashion brand is going to make you tougher. (laughs) You know, it's just hard work and then showing up every day, even the days you fail, even after the days you just you, you just fall flat and showing up and saying, I'm still hungry. Let's go to work. This might be a a vast generalization, and I apologize if it is, but I I think someone should study it. Um, I would guess there's a correlation between the degree of toughness and the amount of Instagram pictures depicted 
uh, making them appear tough. Meaning, the more <laughs> pictures, I would guess, the less actual toughness they display. And that's that's not a dig, but it's psychology, right? If you're out there like posting all these pics, or like trying to convince others through words and pictures that you're like the tough sob. The reality is you probably don't believe that you are and you're just trying to project that image so that others see you as that and then you can convince and validate yourself as as tough. Where I think, you know, getting back to what I said about toughness earlier, is most of the time the toughest athletes I've had is they just, you just see it. Like you don't, it's not, it's not, it's not something that is vocalized. You just watch them race and you're just like, dude, that guy is tough. Like mm. that, that woman is like, she's nails. Like she's tough as nails and you just see it. It's not because of, you know, they've proclaimed themselves or they've got this macho swagger about them. It's just when the chips are down, you know, they come out to play. And I think that's one of those things that that is needs to be emphasized in, in our world. And I think what we tend to emphasize is what I'd call fake toughness, is which is the appearance of toughness. It's the appearance that, oh, man, that guy's working really hard. Or, man, look at that guy. Like, when I has a coach yelling over him, he's able to do five more push-ups because he has, you know, the strength coach dropping 50 f bombs in you know 20 seconds like that's not tough no you know that's <laughs> that's not tough that's that's teaching a guy that the only way that he can respond the only way he can dig deeper is if he has some authority figure over his head screaming at him and holding him accountable that's not that's not what you get and not what you want in a, in a in a program or as a person, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one example and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Maybe if we don't go on another tangent. Um, one of my athletes, um, who's in graduate school, who was a 800 runner for, for me, he won conference for us, I think twice indoors, once outdoors or something like that. Ran cross country for us. Just a really, really tough guy. Ran on our four by four did everything from four by four to 10 K. I think he has a range of from 46 splits all the way up to uh, right under 32 for 10 K and cross. So tough kid. And over the summer, because of ROTC helping um, pay for uh, grad school, he had to do, you know, uh, the summer kind of military program where he went to, I don't know, one of the uh, forts for one of the bases for, three weeks and they put him through all their military stuff and all that stuff. And he comes back and he's like, you would not believe the amount of people who were seemed really macho and really tough and all that stuff and would have this bravado about them when the chips, when the chips were on the table, when they took them into the gas chamber with gas masks on and the gas was on, and then they said, remove your your mask, and you have zero hours of sleep, and you're just on the edge, and you see everyone break down and turn on each other, and just it's just a complete mess, and then and he comes back and tells our team, he's like, the biggest thing that I learned was that taking that gas mask off and inhaling all this gas, making them just you know cough up a lung and not feel like he could breathe, where he went was where he went in the middle of a 10K cross-country race. He said, my mind frame went the same route, and I was able to stay calm, collective, and know what to do and know how to react and not let that emotion like overtake me where all these other guys who would constantly challenge him to like running tests because they knew he was a runner, they couldn't go. And I think what that showed to me is that if well first off it showed that i think i did my job not that it's any of my credit but the kid drayvon came out of college prepared mentally for challenges in life better than i think when he came into college and i think 
as a coach above any of the running accolades, like that's what I'm more proud of. And that's what resonates. And I think there's a incredible, valuable lesson in that, that, you know, he's not a super macho dude. He just knew how, when the chips were down, where to take his mind and how to actually be tough and not need all this football coach yelling at him or this machoism to get him there. He just knew how to take his mind there because he'd been there before and trained himself to do it to race. Fortunes change quickly, right? And it's like previous success is no indicator of future success. And that, you know, it's true everywhere you look. And we, we think once we get there, once I get the job, once I get, you know, this to this program or once I win this race, then it's just going to be, you know, easy. And that's the hard reality is because you did it once gives you no guarantee you'll ever be able to do it again. And, you know, that's, that's really what we're training is we're training the fortitude and we're training the robustness and the resiliency for people to respond to tests of difficulty and, and just kind of practicing and enhancing that mindset. And, you know, two quick stories here. Like, you know, first one is being, you know, an upstart post collegiate group and team out here in Portland. It's like, it's no secret. Everyone here works that's on the group. You know, all these people were multi-time All-Americans. All these people were, you know, very, you know, conference champions, national champions, near national champions, whatever. And then they got out and they thought, oh, I'll just be taken care of like I was taken care of in college at these Power 5 schools. And no, nothing. <laughs> and they're like, oh, I got to work. But they're willing to put in the effort. They're willing to do it. They're willing to say, look, I have this dream. I have this passion. I want to see how far I can take this competitive running thing. All right. And I'm going to couple it with this. You know, and we started, you know, having conversations with athletes about them relocating here. You know, athletes who are already on the scene, athletes who are graduating from college and you know it wasn't like we got a flood of people who were like oh let me sign up for this this is not easy this is a difficult proposition and people were like oh no i can't do this I, I need all these resources to be in place i need this i go thank you you told me everything i need to know about you because if you can't do it without all these things lined up you you can't do it even with them lined up <laughs> so you know you save me the hassle of figuring that out and figuring out you're a pretender and a flake and it's not to criticize the, the kids because i mean you got they're immensely talented and i wish them the best and i hope to see them thrive but the likelihood is very you know small until they change their mindset until they change their perception of reality and until they say, look, here's what actually really matters. And because it, it, it's, it's not difficult if, you know, you always think like the little kid, right? You play with the little kid and it's like, like throwing them up in the air, like a little kid, like throwing up in the air. Okay, great. All right. Again. Okay. Again, again. And they just keep saying again, because they're having so, there's not like, they don't come up and say, okay, throw me up in the air 10 times because I want to practice this skill and then I'll be done after 10. They just keep going until they don't want to be thrown up in the air. And usually you run out of energy <laughs> before they run out of energy. And that's what you have to do. Every That's the people you want to have around and surround yourself with is those type of people like, all right, I'm willing to get up and work. I'm willing to get up and work. Let's keep working. You know, I, another story is like I had an athlete who had, you know, Basically, she trained so hard last fall and overtrained, and you know, it was on me, it was on her, it was on everybody for not catching it. But she trained to the point where, like, she delaminated the muscle from the bone in her calf. Like, that's where the muscle comes away from the bone. It starts to just not a stress fracture, but just the sheath just breaks and it rips, and it's very painful and sucks a lot, and it takes a long time to heal. And yet, she is still nine months later, cannot run but still trying to find ways to get better. It's like, how do I get stay, stay in some fitness? How do I create healthy muscle tissues? How do I, can I lift? Can I do a little bit of this? Can I, you know, do some cross training? Like it's nonstop. She's always thinking about, all right, I can't run right now. It's been nine months. It sucks. But when I get back to running, man, I'm going to be ready. And it comes back to, you know, that, that famous, um, you know, quote that's out there is it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. And that's really at the end of the day, why I hope 
you're coaching because I know it's why I'm coaching. I know it's why Steve's coaching. Man, we're gonna leave it at that. That's 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 the reason. I mean, above anything, that that's why we do things, right? And like knowing why you do things, understanding that, having a purpose for it, is what it's about. So, we'll we'll leave you with John's great summary. Enjoyed talking as always, John. Um, for everybody listening, thanks for listening. As John mentioned in this podcast, if you need help, if you need coached up, reach out to us. We're on social media. Uh, you can find our, our Twitters and all that stuff and reach out to us. And we appreciate the feedback and uh, allowing us to do this because the reality is you guys listening to this allows for us to talk because it gives us an excuse to hop on, the, <laughs> hop on Skype for an hour, um, hopefully every week. So yes. don't keeps... hesitate. Don't hesitate. Reach out if you need it. Like the only way you get better is if you're coached, you That's know, right. and it's like, and the thing is, is about coaching and mentoring is we actually get better too. <laughs> so even if you've been coaching for longer than I've been alive, like I'm happy to, happy to be here. Steve's happy to be here. I think as I grow, I, I want to start giving back more to the coaches because we are an important sort. We need to be, we need to be there to support each other, not undercut each other. Yes. Yes, very good point. Historically, sometimes there's a little too much undercutting when we're all in the journey together. Amen. And remember, you've got to stay hungry.